Well, good morning. And my name is Kevin Augustine with DBRS Morningstar. And thank you for joining us in the latest of our series on ESG and sustainable commercial real estate investing. Uh, in previous webinars, we've covered some of the work that DBRS Morningstar has done in establish, establishing criteria for how we look at ESG factors in the underwriting of our rating and our research transactions. We uh, identified, as some of you may know, eight factors which we thought were relevant, could be relevant in the analysis and assigning of credit ratings in the CMBS group. We identified eight factors. Uh, three of those were environmental, emissions, effluence, and waste, essentially pollution, uh, carbon and greenhouse gas costs, and climate risks. Uh, we covered uh, these uh, in some detail in a previous webinar. Uh, we also identified four social factors, the social impact of products and services, human capital and human rights, product governance, and data privacy. And we also identified one governance factor, uh, really just a general uh, governance factor in how we structure and, and analyze transactions. So we thought that we would do things a little bit differently today and we would uh, switch gears and focus on a few important trends in ESG with some help from some special guests. Uh, as ESG grows and uh, the demand for reliable data increases, we uh, thought it would be timely to cover uh, some of these, these topics. So this morning, we'll try to cover three areas. Uh, what aspects of ESG investing are particularly relevant to fixed income investors, particularly fixed income investments that are secured by real estate? And what are investors focusing on in terms of uh, data and transparency? Second, we wanna look at how ESG data is being collected analyzed and presented. We'll use uh, climate change and some of the effects of climate change to illustrate the type of data that's becoming available that uh, is useful to investors and to rating agencies like ours. And then finally, uh, we will look at how rating agencies incorporate this data into their credit rating process and how uh, the increases in volume and quality of data will impact securitized transactions. Uh, we have some great panelists this morning. I'd like each of them to introduce themselves. And also at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time for questions. So uh, feel free to put those, uh, forward those to us. But let me uh, first introduce our, have our panelists introduce themselves. And uh, Indrina, could you go first? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So I'm Indrani Day and I'm head of investor strategy at DBRS and I'm leading an initiative to increase our outreach to the credit investment community. And I come to this role after 20 years of experience as a credit investor, as an executive from the buy side in asset management and insurance firms, where I was always deeply embedded in the investment research and portfolio management process. And uh, I've done a lot of pioneering work in ESG and climate change since before the last financial crisis and have many peer reviewed journal publications some of the most highly quoted ones being in the area of ESG investing. So I'm really glad and looking forward to participating in today's uh, discussion. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ed, you go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Ed Kearns. I'm the Chief Data Officer at the First Street Foundation. And uh, I joined the First Street Foundation that you'll hear about today, uh, the work that we're doing. Uh, but I joined it after uh, uh, a 15-year career in federal service. I'm a PhD oceanographer by training. I've worked with climate data my entire career, both as a federal employee, as Chief Data Officer of the Department of Commerce, Chief Data Officer of NOAA, and formerly um, uh, a professor at the University of Miami. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm happy, happy to join today to talk about climate data and its impact on markets. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Georgios? Hello, everyone. It's uh, Georgios Katsaros. Um, I, I work in the uh, CNBS uh, group at uh, DBS Morningstar, and uh, I'm responsible for um, analytics and uh, methodology development. My background is um, structural finance uh, for the last uh, uh, about 18 years, and um, also a career in uh, physics-based modeling uh, before that. Uh, pleased to uh, talk about ESG today. It's, uh, it's an exciting uh, field for, uh, for many of us. Great, thanks. 
So I think many of us have seen the rise of, of interest and the assets under management that are, are somehow incorporating ESG factors into the, the, that analysis. And for a large part, uh, a lot of the work that has been done in ESG has been focused on the equity side of the business, has certainly been based on uh, corporate behavior, uh, the impact that uh, corporate behavior has on the environment, the community, on uh, the investment uh, world more broadly. Today, I wanted to begin some discussions around uh, a growing term, a growing use of uh, ESG factors being applied to uh, debt transactions. We've seen the growth of uh, green bonds, and we've seen the growth of other uh, other fixed income investments. And uh, I wanted Indrani to uh, take some time and talk a little bit about some of the trends that that you see in fixed income investment, and particularly some of the things that you are seeing uh, from a real estate standpoint uh, for. Uh, some trends you see in the securities and, and debt instruments that are secured by commercial real estate. Absolutely, Kevin, thanks. Uh, Chris, if you could put up the slides, please. Uh, let's go to the next one. So essentially, there are a couple of things that I wanted to touch upon in the broader landscape that's happening in the investor community as, uh, as it relates to ESG in fixed income and commercial real estate. And probably the most important that I really want to highlight is, as Kevin mentioned, ESG started in equities. However, most empirical research done over the last 10 years points to the fact that ESG data is very predictive for risk. Now, and not just risk on a continuous basis, but risk on a tail risk basis, which is, I think, one of the key reasons why ESG investing has caught on so much in the fixed income world, starting in equities, but now really catching on in fixed income, because equities is all about capital appreciation, the upside capture, whereas if ESG is so predictive for risk, particularly tail risk, then it's so much more relevant in the fixed income world, where it's all about the downside protection. The most important question when a fixed invest, any investor invests in credit, it's all about, will I get my principal back? Will I get my yield payment back? Is there a chance of default? If there is a chance of default, how much are the expected losses from that default? And ESG is extremely predictive for answering all those questions. Now overlay that with what's happening in the broader investor world in the sense, since the last financial crisis post 2008-2009, we have been in an interest rate environment that is so much lower than anything we had known in the 30 odd years prior to that. Now, the more your rates are low, what does an investor do? What do institutional investors do? They will move in the credit spectrum. They are moving lower in the credit spectrum where your credit risks are more. So ESG becomes even more important. It's not so important in IG where defaults don't really happen, but you go down the credit spectrum into high yield, lower rated bonds where default is a possibility. Now you're talking about real credit risk. So anything that adds value the way ESG data does, it becomes very important. The second thing is institutional money is going more and more into the alternative asset classes and the real assets Again, because it's a search for yield, it's a search for total return. And for institutional investors in the real asset space, commercial real estate is really one of the biggest uh, asset classes. And another uh, overall investor trend in the market is right now, and this is even more so in the United States, there's a big generational shift going on where wealth is getting transferred from the baby boomer generation to the millennial investor generation. Now, with this generational wealth transfer shift comes a millennial generation is more attuned to ESG being aware and being much more aware of climate change. They want their money to be put to work in ESG aware investing. That in turn increases the flows into ESG climate change aware investing across asset classes, fixed income, commercial, real estate. And you know, where money flows, that's where there's more analysis, there's more research. So that positive reinforcement loop that I talk about, it's just because of the overall trend of money becoming more uh, ESG and climate change aware uh, investing areas. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, please, uh, Chris. And again, in terms of uh, particularly in the commercial real estate space where the out of the ESG, the E part in a macro sense, the climate change is really, really important. 
And I think arguably one can say 2015 Paris Accord was really a turning point where the world really focused on climate change is important and we need to be uh, we need to incorporate it in all our investments, definitely all our real investments. And a lot of insurance companies have done a lot of quantification of the losses. I mean, just to give a simple example, like Munich Re is one of the biggest reinsurance companies. They recently came out with a study that in 2020, the amount of monetary losses globally because of climate change, it increased more than 26% year over year between 2019 to 2020, more than 26% increase in losses that the insurance companies are obviously very highly exposed to. So this makes climate change and ESG data in commercial real estate critical. And another last thing that I want to tie in is we spoke about how invest long horizon investors you know, money is going down the credit spectrum in fixed income, money is going into commercial real estate and long horizon investors like pension funds, insurance companies, they do their investments to meet their known liabilities at a distant horizon. So fixed income is their bread and butter. Commercial real estate is a very important asset class. And what is CMBS? It's, it's a function of commercial real estate as an asset class and fixed income credit as an asset class. So putting it together, commercial real estate, you know, CMBS is very, very important to incorporate ESG data points uh, in, uh, in CMBS, commercial real estate and things like that. Uh, Chris, let's go on to the next slide quickly. And we can talk about many data sources, but and we'll talk about the green bonds and structured finance, but very quickly, I wanted to highlight climate change as it happens to commercial real estate. There are two channels that we all know about. First is the physical impact. Is there something in the weather events that is physically impacting the site and the building? But I would argue that an even more important channel is the transition impact. Because the world is becoming aware of climate change, because the world wants to mitigate climate change, you are having all kinds of changes in laws and regulation, societal expectations, technology, and how they impact commercial real estate is very, very critical. I mean, just to give a very simple example, CMBS underlying asset classes, commercial real estate as a collateral, but what affects the value of the collateral? What's your revenue? What's your expenses? What is then finally your net operating income? The cap rate, the valuation, these are all driven by these things, you know, what's the building certification status? What kind of investors will buy into it? What kind of tenants will, you know, choose a lease in that build? building that will affect your revenue. Similarly, your heating costs, cooling costs, those are very obvious costs. But we also forget, you know, because of the physical impact, insurance premiums go up. That has a very big impact on the cost. So these are the different ways at the revenue level, at the cost level, that net operating income, valuation, cap rates all get impacted in commercial real estate. So, and not to mention the fact that climate change and the first thing people think about is global emissions. Property accounts for almost 40% of global emissions, according to studies done by the Environment and Energy Study Institute. Very well regarded numbers. So that's why commercial real estate, it's critical to be aware of uh, these uh, climate change issues. And obviously, the moment you go into structured finance, there are just many, many layers. One is not just the talking about the underlying collateral, but everything that goes into structured finance means there are multiple layers at which ESG data needs to be incorporated. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of my time, but I just want to quickly highlight, as Kevin said, you know, this whole movement towards green bonds. So I want to highlight two important things that are happening in the green bond space. Green bonds started with the concept of somebody raising money because the utilization of that funds is going towards, quote unquote, a green endpoint to become more climate friendly or anything in that category. But as green bonds have expanded, now we are going into the space of what is called sustainability linked bonds, which is one step further than the original green bonds where it was just about utilizing the funds for green areas. Now it's sustainability linked, meaning the bond yield or the rate that's being paid on those bonds can be linked to benchmarks. How much green 
impact are you having? How much are you meeting those indicators based on which the interest rate on those bonds itself are linked to? So I think that's a very, very, uh, very, very important change that has happened in the market. Great, Indrani, thank you. Uh, I would add, you know, two two more things that we, we've noticed as well is, you know, you mentioned that we had looked a lot at the characteristics and locations of specific buildings and collateral and how that would have get, get analyzed and what that affect, what those characteristics might have on our ratings process. The other thing that I've seen is increasingly attention play, paid to what our communities doing to uh, mitigate flood and, and climate risk in their own, own community. So does a community have an aggressive flood prevention program? Are they looking at innovative ways to protect their coastline that would in turn protect their real estate? So that analysis goes sometimes beyond the individual buildings to a broader community context. Um, I saw a presentation recently too that, that linked some of the, the changes in uh, laws and regulations and building codes um, around fire prevention in, in America's urban cities. But uh, you know the pitch has been made that the um, one of the big ways to combat flooding and climate change risk is to really pay more attention to how some local codes and local zoning laws are are put together and, and uh, take that tech, tech as well. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to, to move on next to uh, have Ed talk a little bit about uh, not only their platform on how they've looked at climate change and how they've looked at risk, uh, but also talk about the data that flows out of that and how that data can be used um, in analysis of commercial real estate. Uh, you know, when we look at, looked at our criteria, I could pick, for example, our uh, effluent and pollution factor. We, you know, we as CMBS investors and uh, CMBS rating agencies have pretty extensive experience with how do we gauge the impact of pollution and contamination at a given building. We're beginning to see deeper, broader, more comprehensive data on how we can affect, uh, affect how climate change affects these transactions as well. So I thought this would be a great segue for Ed to uh, lay out some of his work in, uh, in climate change and flooding and then how that, that has evolved into a, a database that's uh, becoming increasingly useful. Ed, you want to say a few things on, on your program and, and how you've collected data and what you've done with it? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Chris, if you put up the slides, I'm going to try into this. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, First Street, let me tell you a little bit about First Street uh, Foundation. So we are a nonprofit, uh, and we were formed to communicate climate risk to individual Americans, basically to let the, um, uh, to let the individual American know how climate change is going to impact them uh, personally. And we start with flood risk as one of the many climate perils uh, because flood risk is the most expensive and most pervasive uh, risk in America today. So we're focused just on, just on the United States. Uh, and we recognize that what we need in order to do this is a consistent nationwide uh, partial by partial property level um, climate adjusted model for flood. Uh, so we, we know the science is there. We wanted to assemble the science and make it available in a very consumable way to, to Americans. Um, and so this is exactly what we did. So we, we went across all 140 million properties, both residential as well as commercial real estate across uh, the entire contiguous United States and came up with, came up with a risk assessment uh, for flood now and going out 30 years into the future, um, which is typical length of a mortgage. Uh, that was our, our choice of 30 years. Uh, but to, you know, to bring that information um, home and make this available to, to everybody in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. And Andrani, I think, I think you put it well when you said, you know, the, the, the problem is not a shortage of information. There's more information facing the public right now related to climate change than ever before. Uh, when I was at NOAA, you know, I was personally sitting on top of 40 petabytes of climate information and Indrani said, right, utilizing that data now becomes the challenge, right? So uh, how, how do we cut through this? How do we cut through the complexity of, of, of the flood science uh, and the climate science and the atmospheric science that is driving this? There are a number of companies out there right now, many of you are aware of them, um, that are, are uh, you know, they're called cat modeling companies. Uh, they usually have proprietary methods. They work a lot with insurance and reinsurance industries. This is very, very important for the industry. 
But because of the nature of their work, they don't make those methods uh, widely known. That's their secret sauce. That's important for their business. Uh, First Street would take in the approach of, hey, we want to use open methods. We want to use transparent methods so that everybody can understand what we are doing and, and the kind of risk that we are describing. Uh, and making these publicly, uh, making these data publicly available as we are for free to the public under a non-commercial data license. Uh, we're, we're hoping to democratize this information and, uh, and address the asymmetry of information that is, uh, exists across the community right now. We believe that uh, everyone having access to the same uh, quality information really helps uh, the communities, really helps the markets respond in a, in a, in a very um, mature way. And then we're hoping to, to do that. Um, next slide, please. So I won't get too much into the technical details here uh, of what we did, but uh, basically we, we approached it uh, as a combination of different types of flood risk that, ex that exists right now and going into the future. This includes tidal and sea level rise. This includes the so-called pluvial or heavy rainfall component, like things that we saw in, in Houston with Hurricane Harvey uh, recently. Uh, the riverine or fluvial component of flooding, which is what most people think of when they think of uh, flooding, inland flooding, uh, rivers swelling the banks, uh, overtopping, uh, and then hurricane uh, surge flooding. So we brought all these together into a, a single measure of, of flood, uh, and we did so at a, at a three meter resolution, three meter horizontal resolution across the uh, entire CONUS. Next, please. So we partnered with a number of uh, um, uh, da data partners such as Lightbox, Mapbox, uh, and Microsoft to assemble all the information that's publicly available on a parcel by parcel basis across the United States. Uh, we know where all the buildings are on each one of those parcels. We know the shapes of the parcels. Uh, we we, we uh, um, compute a two-dimensional hydraulic flood model that will give us the depth of water on the surface um, under a, a range of uh, conditions, um, uh, everything from the one in a hundred year flood um, uh, down to every other year along the coast that so we capture the tidal flooding. Uh, and then we, we merge those uh, so-called hazard, what we call hazard layers, how much water is there, there is on the surface under different conditions with the, uh, the parcel information. So we calculate the maximum depth uh, at, at, within those parcels. We calculate the, the flood to the building footprint if there's a building uh, on the property, if there's not a building on the property, we calculate the, the maximum depth of flooding at the centroid of that property. Uh, next, please. So kind of summing up what we're trying to do here. So we, we, we use a lot of different data inputs uh, from federal government, from open data sources, from NOAA, from the USGS, from NASA and others. Uh, we bring the climate models. A lot of you have heard about climate models, haven't been, you haven't used them probably uh, in your work perhaps. Uh, but they are they're very complex to deal with as well. So we we use the climate models along with our data inputs, and we and we we bring these link them together within the flood model. Uh, on top of the uh, hazard layers that I just talked about, we also layer in uh, property and damage claims information on top of that, so we can tune up a, uh, an economic analysis on top of that. And our goal is to is to boil down all this complex science into two numbers. One is a risk score for that property between one and 10. Is it at low risk or is it high risk? Uh, and that's an aggregated risk score over a 30 year period. And the other, um, the other thing we do is we calculate a price. We, we put a price tag on that risk, the expected losses uh, that, uh, that a residential homeowner could expect uh, in, that, in that or a commercial real estate owner uh, could expect at that property. And we have found that these, you know, that these simplified metrics are, are very, are very useful, uh, not just for individuals, but also for governments and businesses as well. Uh, next, please. So we've created a uh, website called floodfactor.com. Uh, you can go there right now. You can type in your address and, and take a look at this. So this is uh, these data are being uh, made available to the public freely under non-commercial terms and conditions, a non-commercial data license at this three meter resolution. Um, so yeah, we're very proud of being able to communicate this, this flood risk and, um, and if we have time, we can go through this or something today if there's questions about this in particular, but you're, you know, um, and take a look, um, you know, uh, on your own uh, computer or on your phone at home. Uh, the other thing we're also doing is integrating this information with, um, with folks like realtor.com, redfin.com, estately.com. So when people go to look 
to find out information about real estate, they are they are able to discover is served up right next along to their with their tax information and such for that, that property information about their flood risk and about their climate risk. And it, uh, uh, we relate the the, the government's um, you know FEMA's estimates for their flood risk as well as First Street's estimates for their flood risk now and in, into the future. Uh, next, please. So this, uh, like I said, we, we layer an economic analysis on top of this. Um, we are using the Army Corps of Engineers depth damage curve that have been derived. So uh, these curves are valid only for residential properties. Um, however, we are, we are currently uh, developing uh, a similar kind of approach for commercial real estate right now with uh, some engineering partners. So we'll have that available soon too. Um, and we, we rely on House Canary, another one of our data partners to, um, to estimate the, uh, the value of that property. So we, we combine our risk with uh, today and know how it's gonna change based upon the climate models going out to 2050. Uh, and we use these depth damage curves to come up with a, an economic estimate of, of, the, of, the, of the risk uh, for the next 30 years. Next slide, please. And this gets a little, a little bit complicated here, but uh, basically what we do is we take the, um, the, the chance of, of, of damage and how much damage based on the probability of the event. So the 0.2% chance, that's equivalent to one in 500 year uh, storm event, the one in 100 year or 1%, uh, the one in 10 year, 10%, and one in five years, 20%. We add all those up based upon uh, how much water is gonna be in the house, based upon those army depth damage curves. We bring those all, all together and we can come up with an aggregate average annual loss uh, so again, we're, we're trying to make this very real for the individuals, but also this is useful information for investors too, as they can understand uh, what the potential risk is for, for a property. Um, and like, as I mentioned before, we're, we're developing the same thing for commercial real estate right now. Next, please. Now, FEMA is the gold standard for uh, flood risk in the United States. Um, and so that's the obvious comparison to make. Uh, so when we do when we do this analysis, and what you're seeing here on this map is where, where where you see the tans, we are in close agreement with the FEMA risk estimates. We start to see the dark blues, we get further away from them. Uh, you know, we're we're seeing about uh, 1.7 times as many properties as FEMA is is calculating right now at the one percent or one in a hundred year risk level across the United States. Uh, that's uh, that's due to uh, a couple of things, but mainly because uh, number one, we're considering climate risk. Uh, the climate change over the, over the next 30 years, which FEMA is only considering what's happened in the past. They're not they're not incorporating climate into into their uh, risk scores just yet. Um, and and also the way that we're doing this at a, at a property by property basis, just fundamentally different. And we include the the pluvial component and tile components that aren't always included with the FEMA estimates. But the first thing that you notice when you look at this at this comparison map, so this is this is First Street minus uh, FEMA, is um, uh, you see that it looks like a patchwork quilt, right? So one of the other things that um, the FEMA methodology, it relies on a community by community negotiation over the methods that are going to be used to assess flood risk in each of these communities. Uh, and this makes it uh, very difficult to compare for, say for commercial real estate investors to compare one part of the country to the other because there are literally different methods used county by county across the United States. So having a consistent method, one method that is used everywhere to assess the risk really helps with uh, these kinds of decisions that have to be made. Uh, next slide, please. Looking out into the future, where, where's, where's this uh, flood risk gonna be changing the most going into the future? And as you, as you can see in the dark purples here in this map, uh, the majority of the increased risk is gonna be along the Gulf Coast and East Coast of the United States, and of course, Florida. Comes as no surprise to anybody here, as that's where, you know, uh, ground zero for climate change. Uh, but when you add up what the average annual losses are around the United States, uh, right now uh, in 2021, it's about $20 billion. We're estimating that 30 years into the future with the increasing AAL, uh, we're going to see that risk rise to about $34 billion across CONUS in 2050. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, flood is only one of many risks um, that, that's facing the United States uh, due to climate change. Um, uh, NOAA uh, does a good job of, of, um, of tracking uh, what they call their billion dollar disasters across the United States and, and what, what is the cause of them. Sometimes it's winter storms, sometimes it's hail, sometimes it's hurricanes. Uh, but in aggregate, we know that, that flooding is number one and then wildfire, drought and others are, are coming behind. 
So for at first street, we are taking these into account. We're in the middle right now of computing a wildfire risk on a property level across the entire United States. Uh, again, the science is there and the data are there. And so we're doing the computation and boiling it down into that the same kind of uh, property by property risk score. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the challenges we have as a nonprofit, of course, we're doing a lot of work and we're supported by donor money right now, but we do recognize, uh, as I said, we have a primary mission from our donors is to communicate um, uh, climate risk to Americans. But we also realize that for uh, commercial uses, industrial uses, there's a lot of application of these, of these data. So we are, uh, we are uh, uh, basically selling commercial licenses uh, to businesses so that they can use these data for, for investing or insurance purposes or real estate purposes, whatever, whatever it might be. So while the data are facing the public for free, they're available in bulk for the kind of analysis that is necessary to be done. As you'll notice on flood, the floodfactor.com website, it is a, it's a visualization tool. It is not an analysis tool. Um, but now um, uh, making these data available in bulk to companies that want to uh, analyze them uh, for their purposes. That's, uh, we have an API and can also deliver bulk data um, and text files as well. Uh, next slide, please. And I think that's it, yes. All right, sorry to rush through that, Kevin. There's a lot of work in there. <laughs> oh, great, Ed, thanks. Uh, I was curious, uh, you know, certainly flood is, is something that's talked about a, a lot. I've seen a lot of uh, presentations and work, particularly that ULI has been doing on, um, on heat and drought. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the, the, the data sources that you draw on or can, uh, that, or, and can produce on some of these other topics? I mean, certainly you mentioned that flooding is one, but talk a little bit about um, some of the longer term trends you see in, uh, in drought and heat and, uh, and wildfire risk. Yeah, so the um, so we've been measuring these uh, you know uh, observations from from NOAA, USGS, local governments. Uh, uh, in the United States, we have a wonderful network of, of sensors up and down the coast and across the, the uh, across the country. So we're able to um, derive what like the what the precipitation frequency, uh, how these things are changing, how how uh, heat index is changing. Uh, some things like it's, it's not just how hot it is during the day, but what the minimum temperature or maximum temperature gets to at night that affects crops quite a bit. And, uh, and of course, with drought, it's uh, um, beyond simply rainfall. It also gets into snowpack, and when that rain falls, um, and if you're, you know, particularly on the in the on the west coast, whether uh, the winter storms are bringing heavy heavy snows to the mountains or not, that, that has you know a lag effect into the next uh, next growing season. So we we have a really good um, estimate of of how those um, how those uh, data are changing today. Looking into the future, we have uh, an array of climate models. Um, uh, the most mature ones are called CMIP-5 uh, right now. So that's uh, the one that's been heavily analyzed over the last couple of years. There's a new group of models coming out now. The latest, greatest are called CMIP-6. Um, and uh, the scientific community is working our way through those, those right now. Um, which models um, do well in some areas versus others is always a, a challenge. And usually an ensemble approach is taken, taking multiple models and bringing them together. Uh, and what we did for, um, for the analysis I just showed is that we considered about 20 different CMIP-5 models and looked to see, um, again, in, in aggregate, how they, are, um, how they are changing and going out to 2050 and how we can scale our current observations based upon what the, what the CMIP-5 models are saying. So we can expect the precipitation frequency curves, for example, to change um, you know, regionally across the United States. And we use that to drive the, the, the flooding model. Uh, the same approach can be taken with heat uh, and drought uh, and wildfire as well. When I look at your, your comparison between your data and FEMA, it, it, it kind of leads the question that uh, there are areas that you believe are more prone to flood, ri flood risk than FEMA, FEMA does at, at the present time, perhaps. And if yes. that's the case, uh, what is driving that? Is it, is it rising sea levels? Is it, is it increased precipitation? I mean, what, what, are, the, what are the causes of that? Yeah, a lot of it is, is those increases in precipitation. So right now, so FEMA maps what they call significant flood hazard areas or SFHAs that many of you are familiar with. That's sort of like uh, the, the general map where the one in a hundred year flood uh, is, is judged to occur. That's based on river and flooding in the past for the most part. Uh, so the uh, bringing in that uh, the heavy precipitation, it, it opens the door to all sorts of, uh, of, of other um, phenomena that are not picked up in the FEMA maps. Uh, for example, flooding in, in the Appalachians, um, you know, in, in, in small streams and creeks, 
Uh, we know that you know about 70% of flood claims are occurring outside of the FEMA SFHAs right now, right? So clearly there's something that's amiss. FEMA knows this as well. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, here to beat up FEMA. And FEMA is undergoing a, a major restructuring of the National Flood Insurance Program, big revision that they call risk rating 2.0. Uh, that is in the throes of all the of all the politics that's necessary to, to get through government reform of, of such a large expensive project. So uh, FEMA is trying to make some of those corrections that are necessary to bring these other 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 pieces of information to bear, so that, that it can be um, these estimates from the government can be more accurate. And so, in the area of heat, I mean, what are some of the things that you might see as effects of the these increases in heat? Does it have to do with crop production? Does, can it affect migration? Can it can it affect growth in some cities that have you know grown before? Yeah, and that, that's that's a big question, Kevin. That's a great question because as 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 populations move, uh, are they going to be responding? Are they going to be moving away from uh, from coastlines? Are they going to be moving you know to the cooler areas? Uh, the, the quantifying um, the impacts of heat. You know, like on like a property by property basis, is quite a challenge for us. We actually have a, an MOU signed with the National Institutes of Health. They're going to we're help we're providing our data to, to them. They're helping us understand how to communicate some of this uh, information that's more tied, perhaps, to, to human health and human behaviors than it is to real estate uh, properties uh, in, a, in a physical sense. But we we already know that some you know from from studies that uh, the the kind of pervasive um, and lower frequency, or, or I'm sorry, I should say higher frequency events, like tidal flooding, for example, um, these things, uh, sometimes it's called nuisance flooding, these things have uh, sometimes a greater impact on population movements and real estate prices than the lower frequency, high impact things like hurricanes and such, right? So, or, and, and big heat events. So um, it's kind of like a constant pressure on populations and people are responding and you can actually measure this. Yeah. Sure. Well, great. Well, well, thanks, Ed. Uh, so we, we've looked at some of the trends in ESG investing, particularly as it relates to uh, fixed income investment and uh, how that impacts real estate fixed income investment. Uh, we've talked now about the, uh, the, the growth and, and management of data related to climate risk as an example. Uh, now we move to the next phase, which uh, DBRS, Morningstar, and, and other rating agencies, for, for that matter, have uh, very uh, quantitative, uh, predictive models for their work that, that's based on um, arguably decades of data. And we now have uh, increasing interest for in how ESG factors impact that work. Uh, for the, the ultimate question is, what would um, a description of an ESG factor look like and what kind of data would be needed to look at in some detail how ESG factors and all these things we've talked about begin to actually affect credit ratings. And so toward that goal, um, I wanted to introduce Georgios and have Georgios talk about uh, a more crystallized approach on how do we look at this data? How do we begin to incorporate this data into our analysis of ESG risk in our, our credit rating process? So, uh, Georgios, could you begin to lay out um, some of the groundwork on, on, on how, over time, uh, we increasingly use this data and make good decisions about how ESG factors impact our analysis? Sure. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, so, I think in order to do that, we should uh, we should probably very quickly cover how we have developed you know uh, credit risk uh, models and um, you know particularly how we rely on historical data. Um, uh, Chris, if you want to pull up uh, the uh, the deck there, uh, slide two would be a good starting point. So, you know, very quickly. Uh, Commercial real estate, right? So bottom-up property analysis is central to, to what we do, right? Individual property characteristics, um, but also microeconomic factors like, you know, rent occupancy, you know, uh, rent concessions, escalations and all of that, as well as macroeconomic factors, interest rates, relative values, regional growth, um, national growth, and, and so on. So that's very, very property specific and very location specific. And on the other hand, you have historical data, right? Which... Um, you have to somehow uh, associate with uh, a property. You have to create cohorts. Uh, in other words, um, we have 
uh, to analyze how similar properties have uh, performed in similar locations over, over time, both in terms of uh, average performance as well as um, uh, tail performance, right? When exposed to, uh, to stressed environments. Um, and, you know, putting those two together, you know, the bottom-up property analysis as well as the uh, more top-down uh, historical data sort of um, uh, almost like a pattern matching uh, approach where you try to figure out, you know, which type of cohort this particular property might fit in. Um, you come up with um, a credit risk estimate. So I think that what we're um, looking at when we are um, moving on to consider the role of ESG data, and, and we can move on to slide three, please, um, is, you know, what are the factors that are um, uh, relevant here? Where, you know, what are the things that we are uh, going to be looking at? And you know, Kevin mentioned those before. We uh, get this morning that has a methodology out which uh, details uh, the factors and the rationale behind the factors. So uh, that work is fairly advanced, right? So uh, we we're making uh, good uh, good strides uh, in that uh, dimension, and um, we we have a good feeling and a good understanding of. What are the important, what are the relevant factors when uh, we uh, talk about sustainability and, uh, and ESG? Um, then the next uh, question is, what is the best way to estimate those factors on a you know, current and on a going forward uh, basis? And um, uh, that's where a lot of the, uh, uh, the data and the analysis and the science that, that Ed uh, talked about before uh, comes into play, and uh, we'll move on to the to the next uh, uh, to the next slide. Um, uh, so, as an example, right, to, to stay on the theme of climate and uh, and weather risks, um, what does the current scientific analysis tell us about these risks, right? So, so these are the, the the questions that will drive how we estimate those factors that that we have already isolated and and sort of developed in a methodology. What's the potential magnitude and what's the direct impact of the related events to the property and to its value? Um, you know, in, in Drani man, mentioned earlier, uh, transition impact, right? This is, this is extremely important. How will the community react to those um, uh, stresses, in this case, uh, due to the uh, uh, climate and weather risks? But this analysis can expand to other, uh, other types of risks, right? Uh, in, in the social and, and potentially even in the governance uh, uh, factor. Um, uh, so what's the potential transition impact, right? What is the feedback loop that will be created once those um, factors start getting, uh, start becoming you know, more and more obvious? Uh, people will react, communities will react, government will react, um, and, and therefore um, the, the economy itself will uh, react both at the local scale and at the uh, national and global scales. Um, and finally, how do I assess these risks consistently across properties, geographies, and jurisdictions, right? Because um, uh, it, it's one thing to uh, be able to come up with um, uh, an estimate for a given property, but if we can't compare it to estimates across um, uh, our you know, pool, our securitized pool, or across uh, hundreds, of different, or, uh, hundreds of different pools that we may uh, have in our uh, investment book, uh, then our uh, overall assessment of ESG risk becomes intractable. And that's where some of uh, the challenges that uh, Ed pointed out, um, uh, point, pointed out earlier become uh, relevant. So it's very important to have a consistent um, uh, layer of, of, of this data so that we can generate consistent estimates of risk. So um, if I were to summarize uh, kind of the direction and the approach uh, we are taking is this, um, uh, multi-dimensional data set that encompasses property level assessments of the relevant ESC factors. And uh, this data set is, uh, is built upon and driven by uh, the types of uh, data and models that um, uh, Ed uh, described earlier, um, as well as by um, uh, databases of uh, property information, uh, you know, potential uh, property level uh, certifications uh, that might be in place, um, energy consumption levels, uh, pollution levels, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and uh, you know, a myriad other um, other factors that are uh, going to play here. 
So um, if, I, if I were to sort of summarize uh, our approach, it would be effectively this um, attempt to uh, create a layer of data that we can uh, query and um, create consistent scores across our property, um, uh, across the property data in, uh, in our rated book. Great, thank you. So Georgios, uh, how would you respond to a, a question that an investor might ask, which says, which would be framed as, we have a, um, a set of uh, criteria for determining uh, credit risk, and we uh, would like to begin to incorporate more ESG factors into that analysis. Do you see this as um, an approach where uh, we, we would increasingly integrate ESG criteria into the actual credit score or credit analysis, or do you see it as a, um, a, a separate analysis that would be uh, presented alongside uh, a credit risk uh, analysis? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think it's a, it's a very important one. Um, I think our, uh, our current approach and, and that uh, deployed by, by you know, uh, also other um, uh, rating agencies and other uh, uh, participants in, uh, in the market is, is more towards a ladder where you have, uh, in, in parallel to the, uh, the credit ratings, you have uh, some indication of ESG um, score that's associated at the, you know, at the property level and um, uh, it's rolled up at the, uh, potentially at the, at the deal level. Um, and, and I think this is, um, this is a fair uh, attempt to you know, quantify ESG risks and to attempt to quantify uh, ESG factors. And I think the benefit of this approach is that uh, it, it highlights um, the consideration that's already in place that takes into account, um, you know, environmental uh, risks, for example, right? So in commercial real estate, um, there is um, a, a, a long, right, uh, a long practice of, um, uh, you know, the phase one environmental uh, site assessments, right? The ESA, which is part of due diligence uh, for um, uh, real estate transactions. Um, and th the reason that this is in place is that uh, actually doing, going through this due diligence is a way to avoid inheriting liability for, uh, for properties, uh, you know, past environmental issues. So you, you can see how, um, you know, changes in regulations and, uh, and legislation can, can, drive, um, can drive more standardization here. I think that ultimately we will all start moving towards uh, the first approach, which is how to use ESG factors to actually um, quantify uh, credit risk and to, uh, to, to measure the effect of ESG factors on credit risk uh, itself. And I think that the, the difference is, is subtle, right? Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can point to certain ESG factors that are important, right? Uh, kind of are important drivers, uh, or we can say, we recognize that they're important drivers and here's the magnitude of, uh, of the impact that they may have in, um, in credit risk. So I think we are in, um, at, at, the, uh, at, at the level where we are identifying uh, ESG as uh, you know, an important or not, depending on the situation uh, driver. And we uh, have done you know, a very good job, I think, of uh, identifying the relevant factors. I think the second step or a second step uh, could be how to integrate these assessments, these individual assessments into um, actual drivers of, uh, of credit risk at some point. Uh, however, the challenges are, are pretty significant, uh, particularly as you, you know, go beyond um, you know, climate risk, for example, and then you start talking about you know, uh, social and governance. Um, not everything has to be quantified. You know, I don't, don't want to be uh, sort of, um, uh, I don't want to be construed that we can solve everything right with math. Uh, I think uh, a lot of these factors can be quantified in a, in a consistent way. Some of the factors will uh, likely remain uh, qualitative um, as we have plenty of uh, qualitative factors in our uh, current methodologies as well. Um, 
Well, yeah. thanks. You know, kind of, we have a, a question in the, uh, the, the Q and A, which, which I think begins to look at some of this. I'm, I'm curious, George, you know, we have, um, uh, a fairly detailed list of data that we require from our, our, our issuers and our, our sponsors and uh, will increasingly being, we will increasingly being, be collecting information on lead certification and other ESG factors. Uh, I'm curious how you see that evolving and what, what do you think are, are some of the data points that you think would be Kind of closest on the horizon, the things that you would like to begin to see from our, our sponsors, issuers, and and what um, what the uh, the investment community might be looking at. And Indrani, you could uh, weigh in on this this as well on uh, some of the, the the data types and sources and and things that investors are most interested in. Yeah, I think one um, one way to look at this is that most likely this will ultimately be uh, again uh, some sort of feedback loop, right? So we uh, will make most likely some assumptions based on data that we have available to us about, let's say, you know, emissions at a given uh, building, right? Or about um, uh, energy consumption at a given building, right? We'll take into account uh, potential information that we have about the certification of that building or that property um, and, and, and other data that, we, uh, that may be at our disposal. Now, Invariably, there will be cases where um, you know the the, the, the borrower um, will come back and say, "Wait a second, you haven't taken into account you know such and such uh, measures that we have taken to mitigate those uh, those risks, right?" And then we'll say, "Well, please uh, elucidate us, give us some more information from your side." And as that evolves, I think it will create, uh, hopefully. Um, there will be efforts to standardize some of this and incorporate it into the investor reporting package that we have the benefit of in, um, in uh, CMBS. Um, uh, and, and, and this way, create standardization uh, even, you know, uh, even closer to the future than uh, would be potentially uh, done you know, using the, the, the feedback approach that I, that I mentioned. Another way is, you know, if you look at legislation that's going on, for example, in New York City, Right, so you have where you have potential um, uh, financial um, uh, fi financial costs to uh, to building owners that that have to do with uh, uh, their emissions and their compliance with certain regulations. That legislation and those regulations will be translated uh, by effectively a line item uh, when when we look at uh, you know uh, property cash flow analysis right so this will be a direct input right there and it will affect um, it will affect our analysis so the more we know about those properties the more we know about uh, how they are uh, planning for um, the enactment of this type of uh, regulations the better we'll be able to um, match our assessment to you know the the actual uh, Characteristics of the uh, of the property. So, I think th these are this will be the main avenues, right? So, uh, legislation on one side, and then this feedback loop, feedback loop, where we start with our efforts to uh, standardize some of this and uh, create inputs, and invariably we will get uh, feedback from the other side about uh, what they have to say about those inputs. So, if I may Wait, quickly, yeah, Ronnie, yes, please. Uh, I wanted to see if you had another uh, another a uh, couple few things to add. Yeah. So if I had to broadly look at it, you know, the kind of data sets, uh, ESG data sets that the investor community is broadly looking at goes without saying the most common one is the ESG data sets at the corporate level, which both equity and fixed income investors use, namely things like Sustainalytics and MSCI. Getting into the commercial real estate space, you know, what kind of certifications do the buildings have? The Energy Star and the LEED are two very common ones. Then anything to do on the emissions front, whether it's scope one, scope two, scope three, you know, the CDP, the carbon disclosure project was really the starting point. Then SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board, which kind of lays out what are the uh, most predictive or relevant factors for each industry classification. That's another very important one. We talked a lot about the physical change, physical impact of climate change and the transition impact and that whole definition of how climate change impacts in these two channels, the physical and transition, that was really laid out by the TCFT, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. So that's really important. 
Then coming specifically to the real estate and related asset classes like infrastructure, the global real estate sustainability benchmark, that's very commonly used both for benchmarking and reporting framework for you know, property companies, RE investors, property funds, and so on and so forth. And again, on a broader climate change, I mean, Ed did a great job of pointing out the flooding risk and those kind of things. There are other similar databases that kind of talk about climate change vulnerability indices. And there are other uh, data providers like Verist, Maplecroft, which does it on a similar basis. So, I mean, they're just much, there's a huge amount of data. 10 years back, we were grappling, coming back to the same point that Ed, you touched upon. That's very critical to, you know, I think how investors are looking at it. We had a shortage of data. Today, we have tons of data. Now it's a question of utilizing them to get the most predictive analysis as investors do investing. Obviously, you're looking out into the future. How do you utilize the data to make anything more forward-looking, more predictive? Oh, great. Great. Thanks. So we've, uh, we, we've answered uh, the questions in the, the Q&A box. Um, I thought I would close this out by uh, asking each of the panelists to give us uh, a quick idea of what they think might be an important change or event or industry trend uh, that, that might happen related to, uh, to, to data and, and uh, fixed income real estate investing over the next uh, year or so. Uh, I think I guess we'll start with Ed and, and, and see Ed uh, give us your thoughts, a little bit of a crystal ball look into the future here of what we might expect over the next uh, next year or so. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I have much of a crystal ball when it comes to all the economics part of this, but you know, definitely seeing how, uh, as a you know, formerly being inside the federal government, seeing how the federal government is responding right now under the new administration and. You know, uh, under previous administrations, um, climate change was being tackled as a, as, a, as a science project, right? NOAA, NASA, USGS, others were leading this effort. The science continues on, but if you look to see who's leading right now, it's Treasury, it's Federal Reserve Bank, right? This is a fundamental change in how government are responding uh, to the challenge of climate change. And this is going to trickle down into, into all sorts of financial and economic uh, ways. And I think there's going to be more of an impact. I think I think you mentioned early on, Kevin, you're talking about community too, um, that you know impact on communities is going to go beyond individual properties. Um, and you know, and one thing, and I neglected to mention this, but the uh, this is one thing we've incorporated into our model are those community adaptation features like levees and, and, and flood walls and pumps. We're we're including all those effects, right? So we're trying to guide communities to protect large numbers of homes to protect uh, the economy. Of these cities and towns and these counties is, is going to be really important. Um, and and at first we were trying to we're trying to respond to this too. We're we're, we're trying to come up with a, a measure to, to charge this. Well, not everything can be quantified. But we're, we're we're going to take a crack at it, right? To see if we can actually figure out um, some measure of 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 the community impact of flood. Because your house may be up on stilts, your, your house is not going to be flooded. But if the entire town, all, all the all the infrastructure, the roads, the utilities, the supermarkets, everything else is underwater, there's going to be an economic hit um, uh, to that community due to climate change that we're also going to try to, to quantify as well. So I think I think there's going to be a, 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 an effort to try to quantify more things in a holistic way so that communities can plan and respond. Great, uh, Georgios. Yeah, I think um, um, I think that a next very interesting frontier, at least uh, to me, is the, you know, the interplay between uh, social justice and environmental impact. Um, because you have a way, you know, or we have a way uh, using data to measure economic uh, impact. Uh, but I think we'll have to start considering what is going to be the social impact of, um, you know, of these trends. And uh, in many cases, to balance the two so that um, equity is, uh, is, is somehow observed. Thanks, thanks. That's really insightful. And Rani? I would take it a step further that today we have a phrase called ESG investing. Nobody says financial investing. We always incorporate financial data into you know, anything to do with investing. I would argue that as the world realizes how predictive ESG and climate change data is to any kind of investing, any asset class, any part of the globe that you're investing in. It is so integral and predictive of financial performance that at some point ESG investing, that word will go away. It will just become another part of another data set that you just cannot afford to analyze and include. So. 
Great, thanks. You know, we've been looking uh, a little bit in our research about some of the links between some of the more progressive urban development models, call it new urbanism, smart growth, and how that becomes a little bit of a social factor as well, that, you know, this whole notion of not only looking at uh, environmental factors, but also social factors, which we talk about sometimes in terms of uh, just integration of, of, of community and uh, community engagement as an issue that will get um, get rolled into this uh, analysis as well. So I think it's just some very exciting times to look at uh, how, right, how ESG eventually will become another way that we evaluate risk in our analysis. And we use those tools to better identify externalities and, and make that impact. Uh, well, this has been great. I, I just really want to thank the panelists and, and thanks to people who submitted questions in the in the Q and A. Uh, we'll continue these with uh, more uh, ESG themed webinars going forward. But I just wanted to say thanks to all who uh, all who attended, and a special thanks to uh, our panelists, which I thought was just absolutely great. So uh, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.